Experimenting is one of the most important things we can do. Mixing things and testing different outcomes has allowed us to figure out how things work and how to make the most of them. Railways were naturally no different, and when British Rail was experimenting with diesel power in the 1960s, they learned the hard way not only how to do things right, but also how to do them very wrong. With the modernisation scheme underway, British Rail was experimenting with various diesel locomotive designs to find an ideal standard design for their Type 1 engines. The Type 1s were to be low-power machines designed for light goods work and occasional passenger services on the main line, and the Class 20s were found to be an ideal standard design. The only issue was the positioning of their cabs. Being set at one end of the locomotive gave the driver a clear view ahead when driving cab forwards, but it was almost impossible for the driver to see when travelling in the opposite direction, requiring either the locomotive be turned around or the driver having to operate the engine practically blind. Naturally, BR wanted a single cab locomotive that had the desired performance as well as clear visibility for the driver when running in both directions. And so, in 1962, they began looking for locomotive builders who could meet their specifications. One of the companies that agreed to give it a go was the Clayton Equipment Company, who came up with a design where the cab would be set directly in the middle of the locomotive's body, with small engine compartments on either side allowing the driver to clearly see over them. British Rail was interested and went forwards with the Clayton design, ordering 117 from the company with the intention of making them the standard Type 1 design. In order to achieve the centre cab, the locomotives were fitted with two smaller engine blocks as opposed to one big one like most other diesel electrics at the time. Each locomotive had a pair of six-cylinder Paxman 6Z HXL engines, with two units being fitted with Rolls-Royce engines instead. Their transmission was electric, with one engine being enough to power all four traction motors that drove the wheels. The cab was equipped with two sets of controls, one facing in each direction, as well as many other quality of life features, such as a fire suppression system in the engine bays, warning systems that monitored fluid levels, the engines were balanced to reduce vibrations, lifting brackets were fitted to make maintenance easier, and they were even designed so that steam heating boilers could be fitted in their cabs, allowing them to pull passenger services. Clayton really did go out of their way to make these engines the best they could be, with them building 88 of these engines while Bayer Peacock built the remaining 29. Measuring in at 50 foot 7.5 inches long, fitted with 8 3 foot 3.5 inch driving wheels in a Bobo arrangement and weighing 68 tons, they officially became the Class 17s, the first batch being completed in 1962 and put to work around Scotland and the north of England. They were received with much enthusiasm, only for that excitement to very quickly turn to disdain once drivers actually started using them. They were also tried around the eastern region of the network as well as the southern, but it turned out the amazing visibility they promised came with some drawbacks. To start with, the engines were notorious for failing, suffering from camshaft and cylinder issues as well as their crankcases fracturing the Rolls-Royce engine blocks failing so spectacularly that they were quickly replaced with the Paxman engines. Within a year of them being introduced, they were already being put to one side while efforts were made to repair and rectify their engine issues. Because of this, steam engines had to be borrowed from other parts of the network and some withdrawn engines were even pressed back into service to fill in for the 17s. Even when they did work, their lack of power made them practically useless for the goods work they were intended to do, even when working in multiple unit formations. Their low power left the Class 17 stuck working on light goods and moving empty passenger stock, a far shout from the mainline goods machines they were meant to be. The Paxman engines were originally built for use in diesel rail cars and chosen because they were small, making it much easier to see over them. But given other, more powerful engines were readily available, this choice is very questionable. 
The choice to have two separate engines as well made them much more expensive and time-consuming to maintain, making them a massive money sink for little performance in return. On top of that, British Rail was putting plans in place to standardise their diesel locomotives in a similar manner to their steam engines, with various parts such as engine blocks, dynamos, bogies and controls being interchangeable between various classes. Because of the twin-engine layout, the Class 17s were impossible to standardise, further making them incompatible with the rest of BR's stock. But the most damning thing about the Class 17s was their entire selling point, their cab visibility. The bonnets at either end greatly blocked the driver's view, ironically making it harder to see directly ahead of the locomotive, despite better visibility being the entire reason the small engines and cab layout were chosen in the first place. While the view was much better than most other diesels at the time, compared to something like the Class 20s, which had a terrific view in one direction and an awful view in the other, having the driver's view from both directions be middling wasn't really much of an improvement. All of this combined left the Class 17s burdening British Rail more than they benefited them. The 17s were so bad that after the last batch was completed in 1965, it took only three years for the first of them to be withdrawn in 1968, with the last going in 1971. A handful were put to one side with the intention of converting them to battery power, but this never came to fruition and they were all eventually scrapped. Miraculously, despite their awful track record, one has survived into preservation. Having been purchased for use as a shunter by the Harpenden Cement Company, later working for Ribble Cement in Clitheroe, before being preserved by the Chinor and Princess Risborough Railway. Experimentation is a vital part of the learning process. We never truly know if something will or will not work unless we try it. But let the Class 17s be a reminder that, while not every experiment ends in success, that doesn't mean we can't still learn a few things from our failures, no matter how embarrassing they are. Subscribe for more.